Hey guys, this is Thunderbricks1, but you can call me Tuna. And I'm here with a little something I've been working on for a while. My beginner's guide to Vigante. Enjoy! So the first thing you need to know, this game is very hard. Lightning Bolt! Lightning! Oh. A bell! I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, huh? Do it. So, this is Vigante, a game me and Muzu decided to play and uh, make a beginner's guide for. It. Vigante is a game filled with monsters, magic, chickens for some reason, and for Muzu, a lot of watching me fight bosses by myself. However, because of this, I can attest to how satisfying it is to beat a boss while dodging almost everything they throw at you. Vigante has four playable classes. Three are available from the beginning of the game, and one must be unlocked through progression. Each class has access to many different skills and can be played in many different ways. For example, my favorite class is the Rogue. The Rogue can be built for archery, dagger throwing, stealth, and acrobatics. My usual rogue build involves maxing luck and putting a point into the dagger skill tree for the maximum critical chance. However, as previously mentioned, you can play rogue as a stealthy character by which you can steal things from the shop and sneak past non-boss enemies for a more evasive experience. Our next class is the knight, and while you could argue that there really isn't a cookie cutter tank class in Vigante, the knight's skills would lend themselves best to a defensive playstyle. Skill trees such as Holy and Shield are meant to give players the ability to avoid lethal damage, or in some cases even negate it completely. However, that is not to say that the knight is left without an offense. The knight starts with a high damage sword that is a relatively long attack animation, meaning that anyone investing in learning to play with this class will need to be very aware of their timing and positioning to avoid taking damage while attacking. Next up, and arguably the strongest early game class, is the Mage class. This class is given access to a wand that has a low attack damage but can fire at a range, much like a bow. However, they are also granted the spell Elect Lance, which is an unlimited use, high damage spell with a short range and short cast stuff. This spell is very powerful in the early game as it keeps you just out of range for enemy attacks, thus lowering the need for good timing, but meaning positioning will be all the more important. Our fourth and final class is the Wildling. This class has access to skill trees, allowing for what could be considered a brawler playset. In my opinion, with a large amount of time and skill, this class would most likely be the strongest, as it has a high damage output as well as a way to sustain through lifesteal. This class focuses on the fastest attacking weapons such as Cestus or Claws, and can increase attack speed with damaging skills such as Berserk. As a side note, the Wildling can be unlocked upon achieving level 3. But, class doesn't mean everything, and mastering combat can make every class into an unstoppable monster killing machine. Intricacies in combat such as strafing while attacking, i.e. moving backwards during the attack animation, or knowing the timing of enemy attacks will make the difference in combat scenarios. Oh, but you thought that was all? No! Parkour, or your ability to control your character's jumping and wall grappling, will be another large part of not only quickly killing dungeons, but surviving the deadly traps hidden throughout the depths of Vigante. And finally, characters aren't the only thing you can unlock by leveling up. The player is also given access to special power-ups that can make the difference in life or death scenarios. That extra 4 health at a bonfire can save your life, and that extra 2 strength can kill that boss before it has a chance to give you a proper death blow. Let's move on to enemy and level design. Vigante is procedurally generated with specific tile sets. These tile sets are randomly thrown together and voila, a beautifully murderous map just for you. Bosses will usually be placed at the bottom of the map in the earlier levels, and every tile set has its own preference on where bosses will spawn. Bosses will not engage the player unless the player is within a certain range. All bosses, with the exception of the final boss, are optional, so if you're too low to deal with it, you can find the exit and get the hell out of dodge. Upon defeating that big bad boss, it'll drop loads of gold, guarantee a level, and give you a special key which, depending on the level, can be used for one of two things. 
Number one is the boss chest. This is the most common thing you will spend your key on, and in some cases, it will be your only option. Number two is an optional doorway to leave the dungeon. In my experience, most of the time you find these near fairies on the second level. But what are the fairies, you ask? The fairies are NPCs which you have the option to save. They will be trapped in cages and will display a cute little emote just to let you know they're there. You can save these fairies by attacking their cage to let them out. Then, holding down and pressing your interact button. By bringing the fairy out of the dungeon, she will reward you with 30 HP and an extra point in vitality, effectively giving you 40 health. Oh, and chickens! Don't forget about chickens! They have the same effect as fairies, however, they will only heal you by 10 HP and will grant you strength and speed buffs when brought outside of a level. Chickens can also be held to gain the feather falling buff, which will slow your falling momentum so you don't take fall damage. Items and their effects are also a large portion of what can make or break run. Items can have positive and negative effects. Some items can even have a combination of both. One specific debuff to look out for is Curse. Not only will cursed items have poor stats in most cases, but you will be unable to take them off until you find a scroll of Uncurse. As a side note, scrolls of enchanting can also clear Curse from an equipped item. Items, scrolls, and potions will all have hidden effects until used or identified by an identification scroll. It is recommended to use an identification scroll on any strange and unidentified items you find. As a little treat for watching this far, I compiled a short list of my favorite enchantments, so you'll be able to tell if you have something worth holding on to. Trailblazer. This enchantment makes it so you will leave a path of fire where you walk. This can also be used to kite enemies to great effect, and even allows for safer kills by bouncing on an enemy's head. Be careful though, because some enemies will deal contact damage if you land on them. Gold Collector. This cool little effect can help you grab gold from dangerous areas. It will cause gold to be pulled to you as if you and coin were magnetic. Death Protection. This enchantment is pretty self-explanatory. It will protect you from lethal damage one time. However, the item will be destroyed upon reaching the zero health threshold. Familiars. An item with a familiar is a great addition to your arsenal. There are three familiars, all of which are visually interesting and effective in combat to some degree. As a side note, there are cursed familiars which will lift you off the ground at different intervals. Demonic. Demonic familiars are eyes with tentacles that will shoot fireballs at your enemies periodically. Pretty good. Compassionate. Compassionate familiars are little floating sunflowers that will sometimes restore a fraction of the damage you take. This one is probably my least favorite. Vengeful. Vengeful familiar is a small evil sword that damages enemies upon contact. This one is my favorite, but it entails a high risk, high reward playstyle. Items with these properties can be found through chests, ambient structures that look like barrels and boxes known as doodads, or bought from the shopkeeper. Speaking of the shopkeeper, the shopkeeper is a dangerous mur- I mean a friendly guy who only wants to feed his family. If you are going to steal from this man, you had better watch your back and hide your children. Don't cross him. Finally, let's talk about shrines. Shrines are in-game entities that can be damaged and even destroyed. However, they will give you great benefits if you play your cards right around them, and in some cases can cause run-ending disasters if you manage to piss them off. The Smith. The Smith is a large anvil when given 1 to 5 equipable items, will produce a new item. If given a certain number of hammers, it will produce a special item and award the player with a shiny new weapon. The Bloody. The Bloody is an Iron Maiden-esque shrine at which the player can sacrifice 30 health to gain one of either a point in strength or a point in dexterity. Alternatively, if you're a horrible monster, you can sacrifice the fairy for an all status upgrade. Sicko. Finally, if the Bloody is destroyed, it will deal 50% current health damage to all entities on the map, including you. The Deranged. The Deranged is a less predictable shrine to say the least. You can offer one of any item, or 50 arrows to the shrine, for a random effect to take place. Sometimes it will cause an earthquake, sometimes it will teleport you randomly, sometimes it will destroy a portion of the dungeon you're in. If given a Chaos Wand and then a Dagger, it will give the player a special item known as the Blink Dagger. The Light. The player can offer 20 gold to the shrine to be healed by a random amount between 1 and 20. If destroyed, this shrine will drop 30 gold plus all gold used on it during the concurrent run. 
However, this will disallow the player from receiving rewards from the light until all gold taken from it has been returned. The Cursed If this shrine is offered cursed equipment, it will apply the God Curse to the equipment. The God Curse will remove all effects and buff the item heavily. However, this item will not be able to be removed under any circumstances other than death. If destroyed, the curse will curse all equipment in the player's inventory, even the items in the shop. The Scholar By offering two spellbooks, six scrolls, or some combination of the two options, you will be given a random spellbook of any rank. If destroyed, the Scholar will drop a random spellbook, but will prevent all further rewards for the rest of the run. Phew! That was a lot of information. If you've watched all the way through, then I want to say thank you. I worked really hard on this guide, and I hope it helps. Of course, if I miss anything, make sure to throw me a comment down below and tell me what I missed. If you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more content such as this.